Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Constangi's webinar, How Do Florida's Amendments to its Public Employee Relations Act Impact Government Operations? A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please submit them through the chat function. You can access the chat through the toolbar located at the bottom of your screen. Our presenters will leave some time at the end to answer your questions. This program has also been approved for SHRM and HRCI credit. We will provide these codes at the end of the webinar. Lastly, we will be providing a copy of the PowerPoint used during today's webinar and a recording of the presentation. These materials will be sent out to you once the recording has been uploaded by tomorrow afternoon. I am now going to turn it over to today's presenters, Damon Kitchen and David Steffen. Good morning, everybody. This is Damon Kitchen. I'm one of the Constangi attorneys in the Jacksonville, Florida office. My partner, David Steffen, and I are going to speak to you today about recent Florida legislation that it significantly impacts employee organizations. And by that, I mean unions uh, representing public sector employees in Florida. But this law also is of very much importance to public sector employers of employees who are represented by, by unions. So now, before we go into too much detail about the new law, I think it's going to be helpful for us to provide you with a basic understanding of the public sector labor relations history in Florida. And so you, can, you should be able to see our first slide. Now, nationally, uh, the, the grandfather of all labor laws is the National Labor Relations Act, sometimes referred to by an abbreviation, the NLRA. Now, the NLRA was enacted in the height of the Great Depression in 1935. And the NLRA guarantees employees the right to self-organize, to form or join or assist unions, to collectively bargain through representatives of their own choosing, and to engage in concerted activity for the purpose of collective bargaining or other mutual aid and protection. Now, although the National Labor Relations Act doubtlessly sounded appealing to a lot of Florida employees working in the public sector, in the 1930s, at the time it was enacted, there was one really big problem. The law only applied to private sector employees. Now, to make matters worse, the Florida legislature had not enacted any legislation comparable to the National Labor Relations Act that applied to either private or public sector employers. In fact, it'd be another 39 years before Florida would enact legislation similar to the National Labor Relations Act which would protect Florida public sector employees. So you might ask, well, what was the state of labor relations between the enactment of the National Labor Relations Act in 1935 and the enactment of what we'll refer to as the Public Employees Relations Act in 1974? Well, it was, it was problematic to say the least. Uh, there wasn't any real guidance and local government and state entities largely took the position that public sector employees did not have the right to collectively bargain or engage in unions. Now in the late 1960s, several efforts were made primarily by firefighters and public school teachers within the state to organize, in other words, form unions. In 1968, the Florida Education Association, sometimes referred to as the FEA, uh, wanted to uh, engage in collective bargaining about teacher salaries and school budget increases. So they approached the governor of Florida at the time, Claude Kirk, because he was the state's uh, chief executive officer. And they wanted to, to sit down with him to engage in negotiations with him about you know, teacher salaries and school budget increases. But Governor Kirk refused to meet with him. So what did the unions do? They went on strike. And this was a big deal. Prior to the Florida's uh, teacher strike in 1968, uh, no public school teachers had, had ever gone on strike. So this was a national event and it garnered a lot of national attention. And it wasn't particularly good attention for the state. Now in 1968, some of you may realize that the Florida adopted a new constitution. And when they adopted the new constitutions, one of the new provisions in the constitution was article one, section six, also referred to as the right to work provision. Now, what Article 1, Section 6 says it in its entirety is this, and I'll read it verbatim. The right of persons to work shall not be denied or abridged on account of membership 
or non-membership in a labor union or a labor organization. The right of employees by and through a labor organization to collectively bargain shall not be denied or abridged. Public employers shall not have the right to strike. That's what Article 1, Section 6 of the current Florida Constitution says. Now, although Article 1, Section 6 of the new Florida Constitution gave public employees the right to form and join unions and to engage in collective bargaining for their mutual aid and protection, it didn't provide any rules or procedures for how to do so. As a result, this led to piecemeal litigation between cities and counties and state agencies and in, in, in their local courts and to determine how to do that. And the problem with that, as you may imagine, was with all this litigation involving different judges and different unions, we, we, re, we re, received inconsistent results in the court's orders, oftentimes on issues that were largely identical. So that was a problem. Now, when, when this Article One, Section 6 of the Florida Constitution was passed, in, in 1968, it was hoped that the Florida legislature would step in and create a statute to flesh out, you know, the procedures and the rules for, for engaging in collective bargaining and other types of labor relations. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. And in 1973, the Florida Supreme Court finally stepped in and said, look, legislature, if you don't create a law to help us implement and enact Article One, Section Six of the Florida Constitution, uh, we're going to appoint a commission to prepare uh, bargaining guidelines for us to adopt. It was only at that point that the Florida legislator le legislatures got off their tail and started drafting a, a, a piece of legislation. And in 1974, the legislature finally passed what's been now called the Public Employees Labor Relations Act, or PARA. P-E-R-A. Now, PARA is similar to the National Labor Relations Act, but it applies to public sector employees at all levels of, of local and state government within the state of Florida. Now, one of the things that PARA created was the Public Employees Relations Commission, sometimes referred to by its acronym, PERC. Now, similar to its federal counterpart, the National Labor Relations Board or the NLRB, PERC is a quasi-judicial body that adjudicates labor and employment disputes among public employees and their governmental employers. David, if you want to take the next slide. David, I think sorry, you should not before I start talking. You think I'd figure that out by now. Good morning, everyone. As David said, I'm David Steffen. I'm a partner in the Tampa office uh, in going to touch on some of the things Damon talked about as we go forward today and also a few, little more background on it. Public sector unions in Florida, we'll just say they're an interesting breed right now and I'm sure most everybody who's attending, you've got your hands in, in the unions with, or dealing with the union somehow, but in general, union membership in Florida is pretty low. I, I'm actually pretty excited. I am going to actually get to do some collective bargaining for a private sector employer here in the next few months in Florida, which I'll be honest, I haven't had that in two or three years. Everything else has been out of state. But Florida itself for total, both private and public sector, we've got about 5.6% of our employees are members of unions. If you compare that nationally, the, if, you're, if you're getting to about the middle of the country with regards to union membership, it, we're a little above half of that, or half of what most states are. Most states are around the 10 to 11% mark. The highest organized states are up in 12, 13, 14%. So we're a ways away from it. But public sector, what we're looking at, we're obviously state government, county government, and our local government. Um, interestingly enough, I don't have recent numbers, but in general, people are pretty dis. In general, the public disfavors public sector unions, um, and that's what we've seen. Right now, there are 67 counties in Florida. I say right now; it's not like that's changed in any time recently or in any of our live lifetimes, or not going to change any time in the future either. But there are 67 counties in Florida, and I'm just going to use teachers' unions as an example because they've probably been some of the most vocal people about this as well as not only the law, but also 
butting heads with the governor. And well, Damon will talk about some of the injunctions that they've tried to obtain or the lawsuits they filed. But out of the 67 counties in Florida, only, only 22 teachers unions have a 60% membership right now. That's significant. We'll get into that, into the laws, because if you're, as we break down the statute, because if you have less than 60% membership, you have a whole bunch of recertification hurdles that you're going to have to jump through. Some of the biggest and rec most recognizable counties in the state, including Orange, Miami-Dade, Pinellas, and Polk, all are under that 60% threshold. In fact, Miami-Dade and Polk County for their teachers unions are less than 51%. There was a recent article in the news about what Miami-Dade is doing about how they're scrambling to do it. They can, uh, they represent something close to 27,000 employees, the union, and they are scrambling right now to make their numbers. In fact, one of their organizers openly admitted that based upon union dues and the limited number of dues that were being paid financially, they were having a pretty tough time already. When we get into the union dues and their the dues check off, as we, and we'll talk about how that's gonna be a bigger problem for them. So what are unions trying to target as we're going forward? They're targeting a couple of things, targeting claims of threats to pay, work requirements and retirement plans. I'll be honest, it's a, from what I've seen, it's a lot of the stock language of we're going to guarantee you your pay. I don't know about a lot of you, but what I've seen with some public sector bargaining that I've had going on this year, I've been bargaining with three different unions. One of them, we just completed our special master hearing in, in April and ended up reaching a, an agreement last Friday instead of actually going to a county commission for the hearing to determine what we were going to agree to. But I'll say this with regards to my unions, there's no intent to cut back pay. It's, a, it's largely due to the job market right now. In fact, what I've seen here, certainly in central Florida is counties and cities are scrambling to find money to boost pay because they have so many vacancies. Uh, and, and so the reductions in pay is probably not something that's flying too well, I would imagine with regards to union organizing, just because right now pay is going up. Work requirements, I'm not quite sure what unions are going to be promising with regards to work requirements as management's rights clauses in most contracts are pretty standard, not only standard, but pretty sturdy. And in fact, it's statutory language addresses what are actually management rights and what public employers have the rights to do with regards to job assignments, work requirements and qualifications for positions is already statutorily established. So there's not a lot of unions going to be able to do with regards to that. And finally, retirement plans. Again, I don't see that as something that is likely going to be changed if your unions start falling by the wayside here, especially for the entities that belong to the state or participate, I should say, in the state retirement system. Again, I don't think there's going to be a big impetus to challenge that or try to start taking away employees' retirement benefits at least in the short term, it may turn may change as the, if the economy uh, continues to slide and we hit something. I've seen some articles saying they think some recessions are again going to start popping. A recession might pop its head up again. That's when it might when we might start having an issue. But I, right now, those things I think are pretty secure for for the uh, for the, at least the short term. So with that, Damon, I'll turn it back to you in the next slide. Okay. Well, why are we here today? What are we talking about? What is this new legislation? We're here today to talk about something called Senate Bill 256. Now, Senate Bill 256 is legislation that will dramatically affect public sector unions in Florida with respect to, number one, membership, number two, dues deduction and collection, and number three, annual, renewer, annual renewal of certification as a uh, for a union as the bargaining unit's exclusive bargaining agent. So those are the three areas where the law has changed the existing PERC statute, which is chapter 447, part two Florida statutes. Now, Senate Bill 256 was passed by the Florida legislature on April 26, 2023, and was shortly thereafter signed by Governor DeSantis on May 9th. Now, Senate Bill 256 amends four portions of the existing PERC statute, section 447301 Florida statutes, which involves 
uh, membership authorization, section 447.303, which involves dues deduction and collections, 447.305, which involves membership recertification with PERC, and section 447.509, which involves prohibited acts. Now, unlike some Florida legislation, Senate Bill 256 doesn't contain a preamble or any introductory section announcing its stated purpose. So a lot of people have reached different conclusions as to what the legislature's uh, intention was through the enactment of Senate Bill 256. Now, according to most governmental employers, Senate Bill 256 is intended to provide clarity regarding the previous nebulous operation of public sector unions by requiring them to account to their membership where their union dues are going and to give accurate records to PERC on actual union membership. Now, if you're in a union, you, especially a public sector union like the teachers unions David was talking about, you probably got a different idea about what Senate Bill 256 is about. They're mainly complaining that S Senate Bill 256 is Governor DeSantis's effort to silence them or to get rid of public sector unions because in the past, and most recently with respect to the Individual Freedom Act, which Governor DeSantis signed into law and then was later enjoined, that the, the educational unions in particular uh, disagreed with the governor with respect to the Individual Freedom Act. So if you're in the educational union, you probably think this Senate bill is retaliation or taking a position opposite of the governor. If we can go to the next slide, Victoria. Well, let's talk about some of the, the, the new developments that Senate Bill 256 creates. First of all, it amends existing section 447-301 Florida statutes. Now that statute uh, has been around since the implementation of PARA in 1974, and it's entitled Public Employees' Rights, Organization, and Representation. This is a provision which states in the Florida statutes that employees have the right to engage in collective bargaining and to join or not to join unions. Now, the new statute is amended uh, by stating that as of July 1, 2023, any employee seeking to join an employee organization, in other words, a union, must first sign and date a membership authorization form as prescribed by PERC and submit it to their union's bargaining agent. Notably, the membership authorization form must contain the following information. One, it has to contain the name of the bargaining agent. Two, it has to contain the name of the employee. Three, the class code and class title of the employee. Four, the name of the public employer, or if you're a state employer, the employing agency, if any. Five, the amount of any initiation fee and the monthly dues which the member must pay, and six, the total amount of salary allowances and other direct or indirect disbursements, including reimbursements, paid to each of the highest compensated officers and employees of the employee organization. So this is a relatively new change. They, PERC did not submit membership author, did not create membership authorization forms for the union to use. And they certainly didn't require that on these membership authorization forms, the unions had to disclose how much dues the members would pay and where that dues money might be going by showing who the five highest compensated officers and employees of the, or, of the union are. But now as of July 1, all new employees will have to sign this membership authorization form and it will have to contain this information. So now new members will see that they have to pay dues, how much they're paying and where that money's going. Now, additionally, the membership authorization form must contain in 14 point type, the following statement. And I quote, the state of Florida is a right to work state, membership or non-membership in a labor union is not required as a condition of employment and in, in union membership and payment of union dues and assessments are voluntary. Each person has a right to join and pay dues to a labor union or the right to refrain from joining and paying dues to a labor union. No employee may be discriminated, discriminated against in any manner for joining and financially supporting a labor union or for refusing to join 
or financially support a labor union. So that's got to appear, that statement has to appear now on this new membership authorization form uh, that PERC is requiring new members to sign. Additionally, section 447301 Florida statutes also clarifies that a public employee can revoke his or her union membership at any time of the year. And then upon receipt of an employee's written re revocation of membership, the union must revoke that employee's membership. The union cannot limit the employee's revocation of his or her membership to only certain dates, like the, the end of the year or the middle of the year. Anytime a, a union member wants to revoke his or her membership, PERC has to allow them to do it. Additionally, if a public employer is required, excuse me, if a public employee is required to complete a form in order to revoke his or her membership, the union cannot require on that form for the employee to provide a reason for his or her membership revocation. Finally, 447301 Florida statutes as amended requires the union to retain union membership authorization forms as well as any written employee membership revocation forms for inspection by PERC. So there's some relatively significant changes with respect to 447301 that have already gone into effect as of July 1. David? Thank you, sir. Moving on to section 303 or 447303. This is good. I think this is going to be the most profound uh, section in the statute because it, it, it deals with union dues. Uh, historically, and most people who have unions probably have in your contract, your collective bargaining agreement, a provision that says the county or the city or the state will deduct, uh, agree to deduct union dues from the employee's pay and kind of a almost a direct deposit. We pull the money out of their paycheck, we send it directly over to the union. 447303 will no longer allow us to do that. Now, we'll get into how that impacts us moving forward, but I'm going to jump around to my slide a little bit. Even if it's uh, our contract says we can't do this, and I should take a step back, this section of this, this portion of the law went into effect July 1st, so it is up and running. So if we look at the second to last bullet point, impact on dues provisions and existing CBAs. Damon, in a, at, towards the end of the talk, is going to get into the, a couple of unions' attempts to get an injunction to prevent the law from going forward, uh, how it's failed, and where they go from here, or from the denial of that injunction. But one of the big points that was raised by the, by the unions when they filed their injunction in federal court was that they already have contractual provisions uh, allowing them to have this dues deduction. What the court came back and said is, yes, that's right. And I should point out the injunction was filed trying to get an injunction against PERC enforcing the new statutes. The court came back and said, yes, you're probably going to suffer an injury as a result of the, no longer being allowed to deduct dues from employees' paychecks or having the, the, the employer deduct dues from the paycheck. But you're suing the wrong person with regards to this claim. Because even if PERC says, yes, we're not going to enforce the law, individual employers, public sector employers, are obligated to comply with the law and they can no longer deduct dues. Now, one of the arguments I've seen raised, we have a, with one of my clients is that in its, the Federation of Public Employees has raised this. And also I know the Teamsters have raised this. We'll get into the exceptions later on, but there's an exception for law enforcement unions or bargaining units. And what these, both the Federation and the Teamsters have said is we're exempt from the statute because we represent law enforcement. And their argument is the statute isn't clear that it says the, the law enforcement only applies to rep representation of law enforcement only applies to law enforcement bargaining units. In my case, they were literally trying to get claim exemption from the law for a bargaining unit of a thousand employees who are rank and file county employees that were doing everything from motor work to roads and drainage to mowing the county highways a lot uh, within the within the county's boundaries. Nobody had anything to do with law enforcement. Nobody was connected to the 911 operations or any emergency services, and that was their initial argument. Counties and county cities have had to make a choice with that. What my understanding is based upon the three or four I have seen is they've all taken the position that you're reading the statute too narrowly. 
and that they are not complying with it. They've sent polite letters back to these unions saying, thank you, we think you're misinterpreting the statute. PERC is, not, PERC is aware of the matter, we've been notified, but they have not taken an official position as to how it's gonna come down. So why do we, and I will still work at the bottom of the slide here, why do we wanna make sure we're not deducting dues? Because under the existing law, and this has nothing to do with the, uh, the updates that came out this year, it is an unfair labor practice for us as the public sector employer to deduct dues in violation of state statute. So if we are deducting dues right now from employees' paychecks, we may have committed an unfair labor practice. We need to address that immediately and start taking action and notifying the union that we are not going to be deducting dues any farther. So go, let's go back up to the top of the slide. As I mentioned previously, allowed dues and assessment deductions that went directly from the paycheck. Damon talked about the revocation period. Again, we have the right, employees always had the right to revoke that. That is still now in existence again. However, we're no longer allowed to deduct dues and assessments from the pay. Unions must create an alternative way to deduct the dues. What they're gonna require now is employees to pay the union directly. That is gonna have a huge profound impact on it. I'll get into that a little bit later on, but state of Wisconsin did basically the same thing with regards to direct uh, dues deductions back in 2011 with regards to its public sector unions. What they found was that union, active union participation for those unions dropped anywhere from 50 to 75% once union mandatory dues were not being deducted from paychecks and the people that weren't very interested in the unions and weren't very connected to the unions just kind of faded off into the sunset and they were no longer participating in it. The reason I think that's the biggest impact on unions is that's gonna kill their bottom line. That their money comes from union dues. They, they, they may do some fundraisers, they may sell t-shirts, they may do all sorts of things but their bread and butter and the bulk of their income comes from individual union dues deductions. So not being able, trying to having to go out and collect these dues from people on a one-on-one -on -one basis is gonna monopolize their time. And in addition to monopolizing their time, it is gonna cost a significant, they're just gonna simply lose money because people aren't willing to do that. What we anticipate they're going to try and do is basically set up a direct deposit system with their members where they sign off on a form authorizing the union, much like your phone bill, your utilities or anything like that, that you just set up direct deposit for. We think the unions are going to try and do direct deposit with that as well, is what we're anticipating. So Victoria, if you can jump to the next side for me, please. 447.305, the registration of employee organizations. One of the big things that is going to come out of this is employer, or excuse me, employee organizations, the unions are now going to have to engage a certified public accountant, a CPA, to verify statements that they're submitting to, the, to PERC with regards to what their union membership status and their organizations. And what are they gonna actually have to establish? They're gonna to have to submit verified statements showing how many member employees in the bargaining unit who are eligible for representation. How many people can actually join the union regardless if, if they've joined it or not. Number two is the number of employees in the bargaining unit who have submitted a membership authorization form without and have not revoked it. Third thing they have to establish is the number of employees in the bargaining unit who paid dues to the employee organization. Who, those who are actively paying dues, they're going to have to disclose. And as well as the final thing they have to disclose is the number of employees in the bargaining unit who did not pay dues to the employee organization. And what they're looking for is that 60% threshold um, with eligible members, dues paying members. If they can't establish that 60% threshold, they're going to have to go back and get recertified every year. And that's when I posted earlier about those um, those union, the counties with the teachers unions that did not have a uh, 60% threshold, Pinellas, Polk, uh, Miami, Dade, Orange, they're going to have to recertify every year if they can't establish that, establish that they have a 60% threshold. And only, as we've talked about, only 22% of teachers unions do it. 
Interestingly enough, the biggest teachers union or the most active teachers union, I guess the best way to describe it, is Sarasota County, where they have approximately 85% of their employees are active dues paying members of their union. That's the exception. That's not the rule. In addition, besides establishing the 60% of eligible members, they must retain forms documenting the union membership and they have to be available for inspection. Um, failure to comply with the certification requirements can result in the union losing its certification with PERC. That means that they, can, they cannot, it would be an unfair labor practice charge for them to represent an employee if, or employees if they weren't certified with PERC. The big thing that comes up with this as well is public employers, public employees always have had the right to challenge certification numbers and potentially get decertified. Well, now public employers have the right to challenge. If they think there's some false information that's been submitted, if they can show that numbers aren't consistent with what the information they have, maybe it's through number of dues paying members versus number of potential bargaining unit members, the, the employer itself can go to PERC, challenge the thresholds, and possibly establish that the union doesn't meet its numbers and possibly result in having it decertified. Now, there are exceptions to this rule or exclusions to this, and we'll get into this a little bit later on, but it goes with regards to law enforcement personnel some first and some first responders and possibly transit union employees are exempt from these, these portions of the statute. But your rank and file units for your cities, your counties, your teachers unions, all of those are going to be impacted by this and they are going to have to establish that 60% threshold to avoid recertification every and elections every year. Victoria, if we can move to the next slide, please. Here's an interesting statute, uh, modifications 447-509, other unlawful acts. And what it, this addresses is how unions, in anticipation of unions having to make their push with regards to organization, they have now, the state has clarified what can and can't be done. And I'll say I have seen this firsthand with regards to my clients, with regards to prohibited action soliciting during working time. One of my clients, we assume that it is, it is going to, dis the union's going to disappear because their dues paying membership was about less than 10% out of a thousand employee bargaining unit. Now that bargaining unit, a former business agent had admitted during an arbitration, he, he had accused us of trying to run uh, the union out of an individual department within the employer. And the reason he was accusing that was the only two people we fired that year were the only two union members or dues paying bargaining unit members that worked in that division. Now we think we had a valid cause for the terminating both of them. The union obviously did not, but when he was on the stand, he was making this great claims that we were just trying to run everybody out. We got him to admit that the union itself was declining in membership and what he admitted was that the union membership had dropped and he attributed largely to retirement, that the older employees that were the most ardent union supporters were, had hit retirement age and the younger employees just that weren't, weren't that interested in coming back in and filling spots. Now, my two cent opinion with that was that was probably true, but one of the things that really hurt the union was about two years before that, we had negotiated a pay increase. It was set to go into effect January 1st of the following year, the union had dragged their feet in some bargaining and tried to take some unreasonable positions. Anyways, they put up for ratification vote the week, the week between Christmas and New Year's and the rank and file members voted it down. As a result of that, they ended up, we had to go back to the bargaining table. It took us another three months to reach a deal with regards to pay increases and my employer refused to make anything retroactive. As a result of that, all these union members had lost a quarter of their raise for the year. And frankly, I think kind of some bullheadedness with regards to union membership was also something that had driven down their numbers. But let's actually talk about the slide. Soliciting during work time. What we've seen with a couple of my clients is new business agents showing up, union stewards being more aggressive with their bargaining. We've had to chase 
union business agents who are not employees off a of county property. They were showing up with boxes of donuts, trying to get into the operations areas of the place, claiming they were just trying to drop donuts off into break rooms. So what does that mean? It means that, well, how do we handle this? Business agents who don't work for us, as well as union stewards or any union advocates that are working for us, don't have the right to solicit new union members during work time. Work time is when they are, if it's an employee who's doing the soliciting, when that person is scheduled to be performing work. Doesn't mean things like their lunch break are excluded. If they get a morning 15 minute break, that break can be excluded as well. That is not considered work time. It's, so it's not hours of operations, it's time they're actually working. The second part of that is the person they're soliciting cannot be during their scheduled work time. Same standards apply, breaks, lunch breaks, just a paid, you know, a 15 minute coffee break, that is not considered work time. But those solicitations can't go on there. You can't distribute materials with regards to the union during work, in work areas during work time. Work areas are the place where, the locations where work is getting done. It could be the warehouse, it could be the motor pool, it can be the office cubicles, it can be company, excuse me, county vehicles. If that's the person's working in their vehicle, that is still considered both work time and a work area. It doesn't include things generally like break rooms, parking lots, or just general public property. Here's an interesting one I saw in there is advocating for union support to grade school or high school students during school time. Now you might wonder why is this in there? I will tell you my kids, both of my kids in high school have had union teachers who are union stewards spend parts of their day advocating on behalf of unions. One of them was a history teacher that went on a 15 minute rant my daughter said about how the teacher across the hall didn't pay dues to the union and why was it fair he got the same benefits she got from the union contract. He refused to pay benefits and if he refused to participate in any of this while she was a union steward always fighting for her, uh, for her constituents. And she regularly complained about not only bargaining with the county but also the teachers that weren't active participants in the union and how that was bad. And, and she was openly supporting union membership when she was supposed to be teaching US history. That's what this law is designed to address. It's like the other laws that we put in place with regards to teachers. The vast majority of teachers do their job, wanna do a good job and focus on the kids. Some of them sometimes get a little excited and passionate about side issues, including union support. And they start talking about that when they should be teaching. The last one is if violators of the statute are subject to fines uh, through PERC for committing unfair labor practices. And what the statute says is you can't send a bit, basically what it says is you can't send a business agent out to try and do your union organizing, knowing full well that individual is violating state law. And when PERC goes to fine him or her, the union just covers that fine. No, that individual is actually going to have to pay that fine as part of uh, the, their violation of state law. Victoria, if you can jump to the next slide, please. Exemptions, we, I touched about this and there are specific exemptions. Law enforcement is exempt and it's all by how that individual is defined. State, for law enforcement officers, correctional officers, probation officers, firefighters are all in there. But like everything else, there's always a gray area. So your standard road patrol sheriff's deputy that might belong to a union or a, a, a detective that belongs to the police department's union, <coughs> those people are going to be exempt. Firefighters are exempt. If you have dual certified individuals who are both firefighters and paramedics, they are going to be exempt if they're firefighters. The way the law is written, if you just have EMTs who are not firefighters, they're likely not gonna be exempt. And I've got that issue right now with the union. We have a series of EMTs who are not dual certified. They aren't paramedics, they aren't firefighters. So under state law, they don't qualify as a firefighter. And we're taking the position that they are not covered under the exemptions with regards to dues deductions. One of the, I believe the Police Benevolent Association has raised an issue because they represent 911 um, operators. 
They're technically 911 operators are not law enforcement personnel. They do not meet the state definition of a law enforcement personnel. So the PBA has filed the claim with the Division of Administrative Hearings trying to get clarification on that as to if dues deductions can be made for the, the operators or if they are exempt, they are not part of the exemption. And I apologize, but we just don't have an answer for right, that right now. It is gonna come down once we get the a decision from the Division of Administrative Hearings. I talked about earlier about the Federation of Public Employees and the Teamsters representing both bargaining units that would qualify for a law enforcement exemption, as well as those that don't. Again, we are going to need a clarification from that. Speaking with some of my clients, one of the things they, they are anticipating what they've kind of heard some, some scuttlebutt is they anticipate either the Federation or the Teamsters challenging this exemption by filing a claim against a county or city that is more pro-union than some of the other more conservative counties in the state, hoping that they will get a county or an employer, not just a county, who is not overly aggressively challenging this in an attempt to, because they are, because frankly, they don't mind having dues deductions. So that's how they'll go forward with that. The last one I have on here is transit unions. Transit unions may be exempt potentially if they, they have to petition PERC and what they have to petition PERC for is saying, asking for the exemption or the, the employer has to act, ask for PERC for the exemption if there is a threat that they will lose federal transit funding. If the, if, the, if the entity learns, if you've got a countywide mass transit system, it's a unionized operation, and the county is notified that based upon state law, they could lose funding for their transit operations, they have the right then to go to PERC to say, we would ask for ex an exemption, we ask for the standards that have been in place, much like law enforcement personnel with regards to moving forward, with regards to cert recertification, and also dues deductions are going to be the big ones. Victoria, if you can jump to the next slide, please. <coughs> okay, well, I think David mentioned previously that Senate Bill 256 has been challenged by at least a couple of unions in the state. As you might imagine, Florida's public sector unions are strongly opposed to this legislation. Indeed, there have been two lawsuits filed so far. Uh, they were both filed on the same day, May 9th, 2023, which was the day Senate Bill 256 was signed into law by Governor DeSantis. Now, the first lawsuit we'll talk about is a lawsuit called Alachua County Education Association versus Rubottom. You might say, well, who is Rubottom? Donald Rubottom is currently the chair of the Public Employees Relations Commission. Now, on February 9th, 2023, the Florida Education Association, or the FEA, the United Faculty of Florida, and the United Faculty of Florida, or the University of Florida, and the Alachua County Education Association filed a suit against the three commissioners of PERC, declaring that section 447301, that's the, the section involving this new union membership authorization form, and section 447303, that's this new provision saying that, that uh, the law does not require most public sector employers to deduct uh, dues and assessments from the union members' paychecks these unions argued that those provisions of Senate Bill 256 were unconstitutional and should be enjoined. Now, with respect to Section 447301 Florida statutes, the unions argued that this new statutory provision compels the union to interject into, into their, their communications with their membership, the state's message and state mandated disclosures in, uh, into otherwise protected union speech thereby violating the First Amendment. Well, if you remember 447301 is the provision that says PERC has to come up with this new union membership authorization form. And this new union membership authorization form contains not only a paragraph about joining or not joining a union, but also providing certain information. PERC's position is, look, any communications we have with our membership concerning joining a union 
should be protected by the First Amendment. And the state government or PERC should not be able to compel us to provide state mandated speech in a communication when we don't want to put it in there. In other words, that was their argument. So the, the, this particular lawsuit was filed in federal court and the, the federal district judge assigned to this case is Judge Mark Walker out of Tallahassee. And Judge Walker in addressing the union's injunction, well, and let me back up. The union not only filed a lawsuit, they filed a motion for preliminary injunction to prevent sections 447301 and 447303 from going into effect on July 1. So when Judge Walker was considering the preliminary injunction, uh, he first looked to see whether or not the union had standing to even challenge the law. Well, what is standing? Standing is basically uh, a, a legal term saying that as a moving party or a plaintiff, you have a stake in the litigation. You have some concrete interest such that if something such as an injunction isn't issued, you'll suffer an injury. So first thing Judge Walker did is said, well, the first question I have to answer is whether the unions have standing to challenge these two provisions of Senate Bill 256. And he looked at the United States Supreme Court case law and he said, okay, the test to, to whether or not standing exists is number one, has a plaintiff suffered an injury in fact? And two, if they have suffered an injury in fact, is that traceable to the defendant? And third, can the in injury, if traceable to the defendant, be redressed by a favorable ruling, such as issuing an injunction. And applying that test to the union's argument that this new membership authorization form violated the union's First Amendment rights to free speech, the, the Judge Walker said, no, it really doesn't violate your right to free speech. In fact, well, the law doesn't require you to speak at all. All the law says, if you look at 447301, is that the PERC will create a new membership form. It doesn't say specifically that the unions have to use that new membership form when signing up new members. Now, the practical effect is if they don't use it, they can't be counted towards that 60% certification that David was talking about. But nothing in the statute says that, that the unions have to use PERC's new form or include the language in that form when they're communicating with their unions. Indeed, the court said the only thing the statute actually requires is uh, if you use that form, you have to retain that form and provide access to PERC so they can check your certification numbers. So as a result, Judge Walker said, look, section 447-301 doesn't compel any speech from the union. It doesn't require the union to speak uh, in, 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 to its membership using language that the government wants. Instead, it only requires you to maintain the certification form. So it found that that it didn't require uh, any speech and therefore there wasn't standing to grant a preliminary injunction in favor of the unions with respect to 447-301 Florida statutes. Well, what about the other section, 447-303 Florida statutes? The, the section saying that after July 1, most public sector employers will not be required to make dues deductions pursuant to collective bargaining agreements that contain a dues checkoff provision. Well, the district court looked at this again and concluded that, hey, the unions don't have standing to challenge 447.303 Florida statutes. Now, although the court, and applying the test, remember, what's the first element of the test? Is there an injury? The court agreed with the unions like, look, the cessation of dues deduction is going to have a concrete injury to the unions. But as David was talking about a minute ago, it nevertheless, can, and, and furthermore, they said, look, the, the by Perk's enforcing of the statute, that it's not only going to be a concrete injury, but it's, it's an injury that you could argue is fairly attributable to the actions of the defendant. However, in the third part of the test is if a concrete injury exists and it's attributable to the defendant, can it be redressed through injunctive relief? And that's where Judge Walker said, well, really the answer to that is no, for the reason David already explained. Even if PERC was to enjoin, excuse me, even if the court was to enjoin PERC from seeking enforcement of 447.303 Florida statutes, 
The statute nevertheless requires public employers to make dues deduct, stop making dues deductions as of January, uh, July 1st of this year. And so the court said, look, even if we were to enjoin PERC from enforcing the statute, that still doesn't mean that the public employers will, will not stop making the dues deductions. In fact, they're required to do it. And as David explained earlier, if they, if they make those dues deductions after July 1, they engage in an unfair labor practice. So the court found that merely requiring, uh, you know, merely enjoining PERC from enforcing Section 447.303 wouldn't redress the injury that they were trying to prevent. In other words, the public employers uh, to, to continue to make dues deductions after July 1, 2023, the court found, in, in fact, quite the opposite was true. The union had presented evidence during the hearing on their preliminary injunction, which indicated that most public sector employers that they had dealt with indicated that come, you know, come July 1, they were going to stop making dues deductions. So that was, for, for that reason, the court, at least the federal court in the Alachua County Education Association versus Rubottom case said that the union failed to demonstrate that they had standing to seek a preliminary injunction. And therefore, basically, it, it denied the motion uh, without really ever reaching the merits of, of, of the underlying case. Now, a second lawsuit, and that, that order was issued on June 26th, just days before you know, the July 1 implementation date of Senate Bill 256 went into effect. Well, on the same day, a different group of unions that, that are mainly down in South Florida involving non-safety municipal employees, they also filed a lawsuit. And they not only filed a lawsuit uh, declaring that Section 447.303 Florida statutes, again, that's the dues deduction provision, uh, they, they argued that, that not only was that unconstitutional, but they too filed a motion for preliminary injunction to stop that portion of the statute from going into effect. Now, in some regards, this, this uh, state lawsuit, which was filed in Leon County as opposed to federal court, was similar to the federal court action, which we'll refer to as the Rubottom action that we just discussed. However, it differed because instead of arguing that the, the uh, that the statute was unconstitutional uh, based on the First Amendment or the 14th Amendment. Uh, the, the argument here was section, uh, or excuse me, section 447.303 Florida statutes is unconstitutional under Florida's own constitution. Now, similar to the uh, education union's challenge in Rubottom, the unions in this case argued that the provisions of section 447.303 Florida statutes violated the Equal Protection Clause set forth in Article I, Section 2 of, of the Florida Constitution because it, dis, it basically discriminated against disfavored unions. And that the argument there was, okay, Governor DeSantis doesn't like the education unions. And on the other hand, he favors the police and firefighter unions because they've contributed to his campaign. So this legislation discriminates against uh, you know, non-police and fire unions to the disadvantage of the education unions, or in this case, the non-safety unions down in South Florida. Uh, also similar to the argument raised in the federal Rubottom case, the plaintiffs in the state court case argued that section 447-303 Florida statutes impaired their right to contract. And the argument here was, okay, prior to the, implement, the passage of Senate Bill 256, the public sector employers and the unions sat down and negotiated collective bargaining agreements. And those collective bargaining agreements had dues checkoff provisions that allowed the union to rely on the public sector employer through payroll deduction to take out union membership dues and assessments. And that was contractually in place uh, at the time that Senate Bill 256 was passed. And once July roll, one rolls around, now, because of the legislation, public sector employers' obligation to deduct monies under the collective bargaining agreements, which is collective bargaining agreements or contracts, that obligation is nullified. Therefore, the, the statute 
basically impairs the union's contract rights because they had an existing collective bargaining agreement that said the employer would make dues deductions. And as of July 1, that provision has been nullified. Additionally, the unions argued in this, uh, what I refer to as the Miami Beach case, because it was a Miami Beach AFSCME unit that was the lead plaintiff. They argued that section 447303 violated Florida statutes uh, because it violated a right to collectively bargain over wages, terms, and conditions of employment as guaranteed in Article 1, Section 6 of the Florida Constitution. And you may remember that was the article that I read that was in, in, in the 1968 Constitution, which basically says, you know, public employees have the right to collectively bargain uh, for their mutual aid and protection. And the argument there was that, well, this statute basically um, eliminates employees' rights to, to bargain over, over the wage deduction. The, the law says from now, now on, public sector employers don't have to, to, to make the dues deduction. And so the argument there was, well, is a dues deduction something that impacts wages, hours, or terms and conditions of employment? And if it is, arguably, the, the, the new statute would violate Article One, Section 6 of the Florida Constitution. Well, the circuit court judge in Tallahassee who was tasked to look at these things was Lee Marsh. And on June 30th, 2023, he issued an order denying the plaintiff's motion for preliminary injunction. Now, bear in mind, Judge Walker in federal court just four days earlier had issued an order denying the preliminary, preliminary injunction in the Rubottom case. So Judge Marsh had the benefit of seeing Judge Walker's previous order. And he actually mentions in his order that he agrees with Judge Walker's finding in Rubottom that the union lacks standing to seek a preliminary injunction for the very same reasons that Judge Walker claimed. In other words, they did not prove that the, the harm that the unions would face through the implementation of section 447303 was redressable by the injunctive relief, because even if you enjoin PERC, the public sector employers are still going to withhold, uh, are, are still going to decline to make the dues deductions after July 1. However, what Judge Marsh did is he didn't just stop the analysis there. Once Judge Walker in the federal case decided there wasn't any standing, he didn't go up any further to determine whether or not, you know, substantively the union's arguments had merit. Judge Marsh did. Judge Marsh, in his order, basically after determining that the unions didn't have standing, went a step further and he analyzed each of the union's constitutional claims with regard to the four elements needed to obtain an injunction. And just for your knowledge, the, what you need to obtain an injunction in Florida and for that matter in other jurisdictions, you need to obtain the following four elements and you have to have all four. You have to show that there's a likelihood of success on the merits. You have to show a lack of adequate remedy at law. You have to show that the occurrence of irreparable harm will occur if the injunction is not issued. And last, you have to show that the injunction, if issued, will serve the public's interest. Well, Judge Marsh ruled that the plaintiffs failed to satisfy three of the four factors needed to get an injunction. The court said, okay, we agree with you. There's a lack of an adequate remedy at law. We understand that. But with respect to the likelihood of success on the merits, we don't think your, your claim for an injunction passes muster. So let's go through the, 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 the arguments the union had. The first argument was, if you remember, that the, 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 the 447303 will, will basically discriminate against favored versus disfavored unions. Therefore, it violates the equal protection provision of Article I, Section 2 of the Florida Constitution. And the, the, Judge Marsh said, no, it doesn't. First of all, the, the Article I, Section 2 of the Florida Constitution protects natural persons, not unions. So if there's any discrimination going on, it's discrimination against unions, not individuals who belong to the union. But even if that was the case, we're talking about very different groups of unions. In order to establish discrimination, you have to show that two similarly situated groups of people are being treated differently for some reason. And the court said, look, police and fire unions are totally different from non-safety municipal unions, such as custodians or cafeteria workers. So they're not similarly situated. So he said, okay, 
That argument doesn't apply. So he next looked at the argument, well, does Article I, Section 6, is it unconstitutional, this new legislation? And what he said there is, well, look, you know, Article I, Section 6 protects fundamental rights. And obviously engaging in collective bargaining negotiations over wages, terms, and conditions of employment are fundamental rights, and they're subject to bargaining. However, this law doesn't really involve an, an issue which is a fundamental right. What we're not, we're not talking about uh, taking away someone's wages. We're talking about a union deduction. And a union deduction isn't a wage or term and condition of employment in the normal sense. So since it isn't, since the court determined this was not an issue that impinged on a basic right, such as to bargain, such as bargaining over wages, terms, and conditions, there was no violation of Article I, Section 6. Lastly, they looked at the, the whether there was a substantial likelihood in the union's argument that the implementation of, of uh, 447303 would interfere with the union's right to contract by nullifying on July 1 the, the language in the collective bargaining agreements about making dues deductions. And the court said, not really. You know, most collective bargaining agreements, and I think David will attest to this, you know, recognize that over time statutes will change. And so there's usually language in there anticipating that that in the event that there's some type of change in the law that impacts the collective bargaining agreement, the parties will negotiate over the changes. And so the court said, look, you know, you know, you had language in your collective bargaining agreements that, that basically provided a mechanism for addressing this. So it doesn't make the right to contract un, un, unconstitutional. There's a mechanism in place. And so Judge Marsh basically said there's no substantial likelihood of success on the merits. He also found that there was no irreparable harm that would result that would require an injunction to be issued. So based on that, Judge Marsh said, look, you know, union, you're, you, you fail. Even, even if you did have standing, you would not have met the necessary four element test to obtain a preliminary injunction. So he denied the motion. Now, the interesting thing is both the cases on the federal and state level are still proceeding. The injunctions didn't, didn't take effect. So now these lawsuits are proceeding like any other lawsuit would proceed. But it's, it's interesting to see whether or not there, there's anything left to really litigate over, especially based on the state court's decision that, that there's not a substantial likelihood of success on the merits that, that set forth in Judge Marsh's analysis. So we'll have to see what the, what the unions decide to do. But at this point, I'm questioning whether or not there's, there's a whole lot of meat on the bone for the unions to continue going forward with their lawsuits. Uh, at this point, you know, they're, you know the, both lawsuits are going forward, though. And that's, that we can tell you that. David? Thank you, David. A couple of things. Damon and I, just so you know, Damon and I both said, yes, we would check the chat notes during the talk we, when we had our meeting yesterday about this and having realized nobody's checked them, I'll quick address a couple of things posted on them. Well, one of them I should have brought up. One question we have is how are we, how is public sector, how as an employer, are we going to know if they meet certification requirements and what is, what, what is being filed? I should have mentioned this earlier. The statute requires on the day that the, the union files its paperwork with PERC, they are to send us as the employer a copy of that paperwork. Now, it, I, it, the statute isn't very clear as to who or how it, who it's going to go to or how it's notified or how they're going to be notified, but we are supposed to get the paperwork. I assume it is going to go to the most senior, be at least addressed to the most senior to person's department, be it a county manager, mayor, board of directors, somebody in that level, but that's not clarified. Second question was looking for exemptions and dues deductions was talking about firefighters. The firefighters are going to be exempt if they if they they hold the certificates under state law. And then the question follow up was: Are paramedics who are not dual certified firefighters exempt? That's a bit of a gray area. My initial, and I'll let Damon chime in on this as well. But if you are not a certified, what the statute talks about with exemptions is you have to meet the statutory definition of this position. The statute lays out what a firefighter is. And if you are not a 
certified firefighter, you are likely not going to be exempt, but that's something you're just going to have to dig down, look at who you're, what your people are actually certified for, and if they are fire, if they qualify under that exemption or not. So let's let's jump into the slide here of moving forward. What 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 does a statute mean for public employers? As I talked about earlier, it's going to be a huge push on union membership. Um, they are one of the teachers unions in the state was talking about how their offices are empty because they are busy beating the bushes at summer school, trying to make sure who is signed up and getting everybody else to sign their union cards to make sure they can hit their, certainly their 50%, but trying to establish 60% so they don't have to recertify. The interesting thing is in some of these recertification elections, and it's, it was borne out in Wisconsin, even though people who aren't paying dues are still voting in union certification elections, they are largely voting to support the union. So what the union is now stuck with is they have the support of their membership, they just don't have people signing cards and paying dues. And I think that very well could happen here. We are seeing some renewed drive from unions to actually get out of their offices and start interacting with their people to try and get their memberships cards signed. That's certainly going to continue throughout the summer. I'd expect it to be heavy throughout up through Labor Day. New ways to collect dues, as I talked about earlier, we're probably looking at a direct deposits approach to this. Uh, United Faculty of Florida has tried this. They're probably they've implemented it earlier this year. It wasn't just directly related to this law. Their problem is, well, 99% of their income comes from dues deduction. Right now, they can only get 12% of their people to, people to go through a direct deposit that does not include a dues checkoff provision where it's coming right out of their paycheck. So that is gonna have a profound impact on unions and their ability to even conduct any business if they don't have the money coming in. Compliance obviously is gonna be the last one. They're looking at the new reporting requirements, both the disclosures to PERC and to membership that uh, Damon previously mentioned. They're now gonna to have to go track down either their existing CPAs or they're going to have to engage in additional work or they're going to have to find new CPAs to certify the paperwork that they're trying to submit. What's it mean for employers? Pretty much I think it's going to be common sense. Review our CBAs for compliance issues. What do we actually have out there? What do we have to comply with? Um, if we're if we don't qualify for the exemptions, make sure we are in compliance with state law because even if the CBA says we do one thing. If that's a violation of state law, we still could be committing an unfair labor practice. Certainly request information from PERC if you need clarification as to what's going on. Um, you, you are allowed to do it, take full advantage of it. If you've got transit unions, make sure you determine that you aren't gonna be losing funds if you're gonna start applying these exemptions. And lastly, I'm gonna say, we're gonna obviously expect more representation elections. They're, if they aren't meeting the thresholds, they're going to have to have their, their elections every year to show that people want to be the union to still exist. Well, that can be both a, a good thing for us if we have unions that are problems for us and they're, they are going away. We are going to have to pay more money because we're going to bear some of the election cost is what's going to come up. I don't think it's going to be something that, that's going to break the bank, but that is just a new cost that we are going or an unanticipated cost, I guess, is the best way at least for the next couple of years as to how we figure out how to deal with this and what type of elections we're gonna have going forward. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Damon for the last slide of the day. The last thing we wanted to talk to you about is PERC's rulemaking process. If you look at the at Senate Bill 256, specifically section 447301, subsection seven, the statute as amended expressly authorizes PERC to adopt rules to implement the, the 447301 changes, the union authorization card and, and rules with respect to, you know, union authorization going forward. Now, by contrast, section 447303 and 447305, which were also amended by Senate Bill 256, do not contain subsections authorizing PERC to engage in rulemaking for those sections. Nevertheless, PERC has been busy doing so since the passage of this legislation back on May 9th. Now on May 22nd, 2023, PERC published proposed rule 
60 CC-1.101 entitled Employee Organization Membership Form. Now, Victoria, can you put that slide up to share that? You should be able to see the, the proposed rule. This is what is actually now gone into effect as of July 1. But on May 23rd, they published this proposed rule. And the purpose of this proposed rule is to flesh out some of the terms that, that are defined by 447-301's amendment, such as what's an employee, what's a CAS class title or, or a class code. These types of things are, have been identified in, in the, the rule that PERC has created. Now, PERC, when they engage in, in, in rulemaking, they don't just get to implement a rule. They first have to issue a proposed rule. Then after that, they have to provide a comment period and a public hearing in order for people to make comments. And if substantial comments are made, PERC has the ability to decide whether or not they want to tweak the rule further. If they don't decide to tweak the rule, then under the rulemaking process, PERC can adopt the final rule after the comment period closes. Now, this particular comment period closed for this particular rule on June 14th, uh, after the public meeting was held on the rule on June 7th. And PERC made a few slight alterations which appear in the text in front of you, but nothing substantive. I mean, indeed, this is basically a definitional rule. There, was, there weren't a lot of significant challenges to the language in this rule. So this particular rule uh, was somewhat delayed by the by the you know the challenges filed by the unions, but once the unions' preliminary injunctions were denied, if you go to PERC's website now, you'll see that this rule has been published for adoption. And when I spoke to PERC yesterday, I spoke to the clerk Barry Dudd. PERC's position on this rule is it's already gone into effect as of July one. And if you look at the very bottom of the rule. That's, it, that's the proposed date saying when it was going to go into effect. Now, now on the same day uh, as this rule was published, PERC uh, published its proposed membership authorization form. This is the form that new members are going to be required to sign. And, and if you look at this, you know, it's, it's, it's much more substantial than what the unions were previously using. If you look down about halfway down, you see the section says officer employee compensation. That's where they have to list, you know, the five highest paid uh, officers and employees of the union. So now this is information that the person when they're signing up to join the union gets to see, okay, wow, union people are getting paid this amount of money. Uh, you know, and then that raises a question, well, where's my, my initiation fee and, and membership going? Is it going to, to perform, you know, good for the union or is it going to pay somebody's salary? Also, if we scroll down to the second page, now you see at the very top, this is the portion that the union said was compelled speech in violation of the First Amendment. The part says the state of Florida wants you to know the following. This is what they said, we shouldn't, the state shouldn't be coming in and telling us what we communicate to people who want to join the members. We should be free to say that. As you can see, the, the form very clearly has the paragraph required by state law. So this form two was submitted to for public comment on June 7, uh, and according to PERC is now in effect. This is now the, the union membership form that needs to be used. Now, on June 22nd, 2023, PERC published a preliminary text of proposed rules for the three for the exemptions in three rules. So the first exemption up here, uh, 60 CC-1.104 is the is is involves the union membership form. And this just fleshes out a little further what David already said. Remember, police and fire unions are exempt from having to use the membership authorization form we just showed you. And that's what this rule says. The next rule deals with payroll deductions. And again, it says that police and fire unions are exempt. But what's interesting here, and, and David touched on this a minute ago, is, well, what if, you know, who does this apply to? I think David mentioned that the Teamsters have taken the position that, well, since they represent uh, police and fire unions, uh, perhaps in other counties or municipalities, 
the fact that they represent those police and fire unions might excuse them in another county uh, from having to, to uh, basic, basically excuse the public employer from having to make dues deductions for, for non-police and fire unions in another county. So in other words, if the Teamsters have police and fire unions in Broward County, but they only have non-safety non, uh, unions in Dade County, um, the law would require the public employers in Dade County to deduct, to continue making the dues deductions because the Teamsters uh, represent police and fire people in another, in, in another area. This statute seems to, seems to suggest that the dues deduction only applies to dues and assessments deducted and collected from the salaries of employees in a bargaining unit that includes a law enforcement officer. So this language is contrary to the Teamsters position that they're currently taking. This is Perk's position on this. Perk's position is the dues deduction, you know, whether or not an employer continues to make a dues deduction or not, is going to depend on the, the membership in the bargaining unit. If you have police officers, correctional officers, probation officers, or firefighters in the bargaining unit, then the public sector employer continue in perk size would continue to make the dues deductions. However, if the Teamsters are representing a unit that doesn't have any of those individuals in its bargaining unit, then the public employer would not make the deduction. Now, again, it's important to note, this is a preliminary rule. This is a proposed rule and it's been submitted uh, for, for, uh, for public comment on July 17th. So my guess is on July 17th in the offices of PERT, there's gonna be a firestorm over this particular issue. This is gonna be the battleground. But PERC's position for right now is that, that these proposed rules uh, should be adopted. And at that point, I think we're, we're, we've covered the subject. I don't know if anybody has any questions. And I'm checking the chat. Yeah, I, I see a question that, that says, does that mean as long as the police officers in a bargaining unit, then the whole unit is exempt, even if 911 operators are included? I think if you can put the PERC rule back up, Victoria, the proposed rules that the slide we just had, I think PERC's position would be, the answer to that question would be yes. The, 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 it says, if you read the, it says, the exception provided in 447-3031 as amended by chapter 23-35 section three from prohibition on deduction and collection of dues and uniform assessments by an employer applies only to the dues and assessments deducted and collected from the salaries of employees in a bargaining unit that includes law enforcement, correctional officers or correctional probation officers as those terms are defined. So the way I read that, and David, you might disagree is that if you have any of these individuals in the bargaining unit, then the public uh, employer's obligation would be to, to continue making the dues deductions. But in the absence of that, you would cease making the dues deductions. And as David said, stated earlier, if you fail to make the, if you continue to make those dues deductions after July 1, you know, you, you face the risk of, of, of getting an unfair labor practice charge. I would agree with that. And as I indicated earlier, the Police Benevolent Association is, is looking for clarification itself on that because of that very issue. The problem is we just don't have it. Yeah. Um, I think the so position, we're... David, is to be better safe than sorry. I think you could at least, you know, you have some, some statutory cover by, 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 if in doubt, stopping the dues deduction. Yes. But, but, but right now, I mean, it's, it's, it's a gray area. It's very gray. Well, well, thank you very much. Victoria, did you have any closing comments? Yes, um, on the screen, you will see the SHRM activity ID and HRCI activity ID. Please feel free to jot these down. We'll give you a couple of seconds to do that before we end today's presentation. And while we're doing that, if you have questions, you can reach out to Damon or I 
uh, for, for a quick follow-up or a clarification, please feel free to do so. Um, we'll be happy to chat with you. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. We will now end today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you.